Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Strain, Director of Economic Policy Studies here at AI. Thank you all for being here to discuss the important topic of poverty in America. How are we doing? How did we get here? How can we do better? Thanks also to those of you watching the live stream and to those who will watch the video later on. It's my honor and my pleasure to welcome Kevin Hassett back to AEI today. Dr. Hassett is the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. In that role, he is President Trump's chief economist. Prior to serving in the Trump administration, Kevin held a long and distinguished career here at AEI. Kevin was my predecessor as director of economic studies. Immediately before leaving, he was director of research for domestic policy and the James Q. Wilson Senior Fellow in American Politics and Culture. A noted expert in the field of public finance, Kevin has published many peer-reviewed articles in leading economics journals, books, chapters in, scholar in scholarly books, and policy papers. He holds a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, before joining the administration, Kevin was also a prolific writer for popular audiences, including as a columnist for Bloomberg and National Review. Kevin has long given policy advice to some of our nation's most senior elected leaders. One of those leaders was the late Senator John McCain. When I learned I was going to introduce Kevin today, I took a look at Senator McCain's statement about Kevin's nomination to be CEA chair in the congressional record. Quote, I have known Kevin for quite some time, beginning when he served as the chief economic advisor to my presidential campaign in 2000, Senator McCain said. Displaying his characteristic wit, the senator continued, the only time I have doubted his intellect was when Kevin agreed to return to advise for my 2008 presidential campaign. <laughs> to fully understand how smart he is, Senator McCain continued, Kevin's former colleague told me the story of how he printed out a 400 plus page technical paper at Kevin's request, only to realize he had printed out the original German version rather than an English translation. Without batting an eye, Kevin said, no problem, and went about reading the scholarly report in German. I could go on, but let me just say again, what a pleasure it is to have my friend and former colleague, Kevin Hassett, back at AEI. Kevin, the halls of AEI are filled with people whose careers are so much better for having been your colleague. And when I look in the audience, I see that uh, many of those people who are better for having been your colleague, you've, you've taken uh, from us to the CEA, which is, which is also fantastic. Uh, before I depart the stage, a quick word on the run of show for today. Uh, Dr. Hassett will give remarks from this podium after which he and my AEI colleague, Robert Dorr, will have a conversation uh, on this stage. Following their conversation, our expert panel will uh, engage in a discussion. My colleague, Robert Dorr, is the Mortgage Fellow in Poverty Studies at AEI. Before joining AEI, he worked for Mayor Bloomberg as Commissioner of New York City's Human Resources Administration, where he administered 12 public assistance programs, including welfare, food assistance, public health insurance, and help for people living with HIV AIDS. Before joining the Bloomberg administration, Mr. Dorr was New York State Commissioner of Social Services, helping make New York a model for the implementation of welfare reform, which obviously has important implications for the topic of our, of our discussion today. Uh, and with that, please join me in welcoming to this podium the Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, that was that was really an astonishingly generous uh, and largely inaccurate introduction, uh, but I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful to be back here. It turns out that the government ethics rules are so bizarre uh, that I had to give the White House now for about 15 months. But uh, my ethics officer, uh, who's also a former AEI scholar, Joel Zinberg, has approved uh, this talk, and, and it's really great to be here. Uh, some of you who have seen me around town will know that uh, I noticed in the White House early on an arbitrage. Uh, and the arbitrage is just that uh, if you give a speech, uh, then you have to run through all these hoops and everybody gets all upset about what you say. And it can take a week and you make five enemies. Uh, and, but then finally you have a speech to give. Uh, but if you do a fireside chat, then there, no one can review what you're doing because you just go on stage and people ask you questions. And so one of my arbitrages over the last year has been that I'll go, agree to go speak at a think tank, and then I'll do a fireside chat. And then the first question is, so what are you thinking about? <laughs> at which point I can kind of give my speech. Uh, but, but today, uh, we're not playing that game. 
and, and in fact, uh, we, we have a speech. And so I, I apologize uh, in advance for the fact that I'm bad at reading speeches. Uh, but we really had a lot of extremely important uh, stuff to say, and we wanted to make sure that we said it precisely and, and so on. And a lot of the work uh, that I'm going to talk about in my prepared remarks uh, you know, is heavily reliant on the work uh, not only of people here at AEI, but also Bell Sawhill has taught me so much about this stuff over, over the years. And yeah, I really look forward to watching your conversation af after my talk. Um, so here goes. So, so today, our economy is much stronger than most any economist expected just two years ago. GDP grew by 4.2% last quarter on an annual basis and has consistently outperformed the expectations of nonpartisan forecasters. It's even, believe it or not, out outpaced my own forecast at CEA. And so it turns out that being wrong can actually be a very positive experience, although we have to pursue that in the White House with uh, moderation. Uh, the unemployment rate is at 3.9%. Wages are rising, more people are coming off the sidelines and into the labor force. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, along with major deregulation, have set us on a path forward uh, towards sustained economic growth over the foreseeable future. Now, economic growth is especially important for Americans at the bottom of the income distribution. Census data released earlier this month showed that mean real income grew in every quintile of the income distribution between 2016 and 2017. Over the same period, the official poverty rate fell from 12.7% to 12.3%, with even larger reductions for Hispanic and black Americans who reached record low poverty rates. As more people work, poverty rates fall. In 2017, only 2% of year-round full-time workers lived in a family whose income was below the poverty line. But work is not only important for increasing material resources, it's also essential for provide, providing people with dignity and meaning. As Arthur Brooks has pointed out, people who feel successful at work are twice as happy as people who don't, even when controlling for how much income they have. The importance of work for improving the lives of low-income Americans, a topic that's received so much attention in the work of Arthur Brooks and Robert Doerr and Mike Strain and the rest of the team here at AEI, has motivated the Trump administration to ensure our welfare programs do a better job of promoting work. And I can add, as an aside, this is not in the speech, that the person who's really at the front line of this in the White House is Kevin Corinth, my colleague, uh, who joined me at the CEA and was a scholar here at AEI before he went over. And so if you've noticed a reduction in the output in this space, it's because Kevin's over at CEA. Uh, the president issued an executive order in April of this year requiring agencies to ensure their rules are consistent with promoting work and self-sufficiency. Likewise, the Department of Health and Human Services has approved demonstration projects from several states that implement community engagement requirements in the Medicaid program. The President also supports efforts to include stronger work requirements in the food stamp program as part of the Farm Bill negotiations. And in the context of these efforts, the Council of Economic Advisors released a report this summer expanding work requirements in non-cash welfare programs, all that in quotes, illustrating the value of promoting work in welfare programs. In the rest of my remarks, I'll answer two questions based on the CEA report that were discussed widely uh, in the media after the report came out. The first question is, is the war on poverty that President Johnson declared in 1964 over? And if so, what should we do next? So is the war on poverty over? Well, is poverty over in America? Of course not. On a given night, over half a million people, and that's probably a low estimate, go without a home in the United States. Many more struggle to make ends meet. While the poorest Americans are substantially better off than the poorest people in developing countries, our official poverty standard is and should be higher than that of developing countries. Regardless of political affiliation, Americans believe we should provide a helping hand to those most in need. That said, whether the war on poverty is over is a different question than whether po poverty is over. The war on poverty was a historical commitment made by President Lyndon Johnson in 1964 to reduce poverty in America. In our CEA report, we stated, based on historical standards of material well-being and the terms of engagement, our war on poverty is largely over and largely a success. The basis for our claim is not original research by the Council of Economic Advisors. It comes from widely respected research by a University of Chicago professor and AEI visiting scholar, uh, there he is in the front row, uh, Bruce Meyer and Notre Dame professor uh, James Sullivan. These two economists have developed a measure of poverty that improves on the Census Bureau's official poverty measure. They show, using data that's based on consumption rather than income, 
and more properly adjust their poverty thresholds for inflation each year, that there's been a dramatic decline in poverty since the early 1960s. This decline is far greater than that found either by the official poverty measure or the supplemental poverty measure. If you look at the slide, I guess, behind me, uh, you can see trends in poverty using these three different measures. The official poverty rate in blue shows little change since 1968. One major problem with the official measure is that it excludes federal taxes paid and credits received as the earned income tax credit, as well as in-kind transfers such as food stamps, Medicaid, and housing assistance. It makes little sense to measure progress in the war on poverty by excluding these major anti-poverty programs whose expenditures have grown dramatically over time. Under the official measure, no expansion of these programs could ever directly reduce poverty since they simply are not counted. Another major problem is that it overstates inflation and hence increases its poverty thresholds more than necessary to maintain a constant real income threshold over time. Both these problems are well accepted in the academic literature. In green, you can see the supplemental poverty rate, which is an alternative measure reported by the census for each year since 2009 and has been extended further back in time by Leanna Fox, not Liam Fox, uh, and her co-authors. That was the note I put myself in the reading text. The supplemental poverty rate does include some in-kind benefits like food stamps and the earned income tax credit, but it does not tell us how absolute levels of well-being have changed over time. That's because its thresholds are updated each year based on spending patterns by moderate income households. When the economy grows and real spending increases by these households, you can end up with more poverty even if the real income of poor households increases, but does not do so at the same rate as the thresholds. The third line in red is the consumption-based poverty rate trend published by Meyer and Sullivan just last year in an AEI report. Bruce Meyer is here today, as I've said, and he'll comment more on this work later. And here I'll simply say that poverty levels are ultimately based on arbitrary thresholds. Meyer and Sullivan anchor their measure so that the consumption-based poverty rate equals the official poverty rate in 1980. You can see this happens at the black line on the chart. When doing so, consumption-based poverty falls from 30% in 1961 to 3% in 2016. That's a staggering 90% reduction in poverty. Compare this trend with the flatter trends of the other two poverty measures. Also, the very low 3% consumption poverty level today would be even lower if instead of anchoring poverty at the 19 official, 1980 official poverty level, Meyer and Sullivan had anchored it at the original 1964 level set by President Johnson. So if we're going to evaluate President Johnson's war on poverty. That's not a bad thing to look at. Using this measure based on historical standards and the terms of engagement, President Johnson's war on poverty is largely over and a success. Of course, no poverty measure is perfect, especially when relying on surveys. There's also honest debate about the best measures of inflation. That said, Meyer and Sullivan's consumption-based measure is backed by a large body of scientific evidence and, in our opinion, is the best measure of, of poverty currently available. So to sum up, our answer to question one, poverty has, of course, not been eliminated in America. However, the war on poverty has dramatically reduced material hardship based on historical standards. And this is really, uh, this part of, uh, of our work is, is a message for those on the right who've been critical of these poverty programs, those who deny substantial progress in reducing poverty are rejecting the best evidence we currently have and denying the importance and the important role of existing anti-poverty programs, the role that they've played in providing resources to the bottom part of the income distribution. So that's the good news. The bad news is that these policies did not achieve that success by increasing work and self-sufficiency in the bottom part of the income distribution as President Johnson imagined. As the Council of Economic Advisers wrote in the 1964 Economic Report of the President at the onset of the War on Poverty, open quote, Americans want to earn the American standard of living by their own efforts and contributions, close quotes. Collectively, our welfare programs have had a negative effect on the employment of non-disabled working age adults. Nonetheless, most experts agree that the negative effect on earnings is outweighed by the additional benefits from welfare programs and hence welfare programs have helped reduce material hardship since the 60s. So what should we do next? That brings us to the second question. What do we do now? In short, the answer is to better promote work and self-sufficiency. To begin to see why, I'd like to show you a different trend. Going back to 19... You got it, Kevin? Yeah. Going back to 1979, this slide shows the percent of non-disabled working-age adults receiving benefits from four key welfare programs, Medicaid, food stamps, housing assistance, and TANF. 
formerly the AFTC program. In 1979, 9.5% of non-disabled working age adults re received benefits from at least one of these programs. In 2016, 19.4% did. While we've made dramatic progress in reducing material hardship, we're not winning the war for self-sufficiency. Now, the fact that more non-disabled working age adults are receiving welfare benefits does not necessarily mean that they aren't working. Expansions in food stamp and Medicaid eligibility have allowed more people to both work and receive benefits. If most work-capable adults receiving welfare were working substantial hours each week uh, throughout the year, then growing welfare roles would not necessarily be cause for concern. Unfortunately, our CEA report shows that the majority of work-capable adults on Medicaid, food stamps, and housing assistance programs are not working a substantial number of hours each week. As you can see from the slide here, 53% of Medicaid recipients, 54% of food stamp recipients, and 45% of housing assistance recipients work zero hours during a given month of benefit receipt. Between 61% and 70% work less than 30 hours per week across these three programs. You can also see from the next slide that non-disabled working age adults make up the majority of all adults on these welfare programs. That means that there are a lot of potentially work-capable Americans on the sidelines receiving welfare and not working. We estimate that among non-disabled working age adults, there are 9 million on Medicaid who are not working, 10 million on food stamps who are not working, and 2 million with housing assistance who are not working in a given month. Now what do all these numbers mean? They do not mean that the receipt of welfare benefits is causing all of these individuals not to work, although economic theory and empirical evidence suggests that it plays some role. These numbers also do not mean that most work-capable welfare recipients never work. In fact, many do work in either the year before or after a given month of benefit receipt, according to research from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. So what's the problem? Welfare reforms in the 90s changed an aid to families with dependent children program that encouraged single mothers to stay out of the labor force into the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, whose focus was providing temporary benefits to single mothers as they transitioned into the workforce. Those reforms, plus a dramatic increase in the earned income tax credit, increased the employment of single mothers, while at the same time reducing their program dependency and poverty rates. Welfare reforms since then, especially in the wake of the Great Recession, have done the opposite. They've effectively provided what amounts to a guaranteed minimum income uh, program via the provision of an in-kind transfer uh, to non-disabled working age adults who are not working or preparing for work. This is not in the long-term interest of these recipients. If we agree that we need to do a better job of promoting work and self-sufficiency of welfare programs, and who, who could not, then the next question we need to ask is how do we do that? One extremely important answer is to reward work. We currently invest over $60 billion each year in the Earned Income Tax Credit, which subsidizes the earnings of low-income families, and to a much lesser extent, adults without children. In 2018, the maximum annual credit for a family with three children exceeds $6,000. But it's not enough to reward work, we need to require work as well. The main cash assistance programs for non-disabled low-income families, TANF, already has very strong work requirements. But non-cash programs like Medicaid and food stamps have become much more important in providing aid to low-income Americans, and so renewed effort is needed for these programs. As we think about expanding work requirements in these non-cash programs, it's crucial to design requirements carefully. Some working-age adults may not have a disability but still have limitations that prevent their working. Generous waivers of work requirements for these people are needed. Others may be capable of work but require additional support such as childcare. It's crucial that work requirements also allow for activities like extended periods of temporary job search, training, and work fair when private employment is unavailable. Finally, it's imperative to note that children of adults subject to work requirements are positively affected when their parents work more and bring in additional income. Research has shown that work-conditioned assistance in the form of the Earned Income Tax Credit has especially substantial benefits for children. Still, for our two largest welfare programs, it's important to maintain benefits for children, even if their parents fail to comply with work requirements. Children should not lose Medicaid coverage or their share of food stamp benefits, regardless of their parents' actions. This is especially important in light of research showing that children see long-term benefits as a result of Medicaid and food stamp receipt. Of course, the best long-term outcome for parents and their kids is increased earnings through work and self-sufficiency. 
Ultimately, we must decide what the purpose is of our welfare programs. If we simply want a floor below which no one can fall regardless of their actions, then the status quo or a formal negative income tax is the right approach. But if we think it's a fundamentally important thing that every non-disabled working age adult who can work should work in return for public assistance, then we need to think about how to better promote work in our welfare programs. More broadly, we have to think about ways to reconnect people to society. Connection to work is central, but so is connection to family and community. Scott Winship and his team at the Joint Economic Committee have shown in their social capital project how Americans are being left behind on these other dimensions of well-being. We're less likely to live with our families than we used to, we spend less time with our neighbors, and we're less likely to attend religious services. So while we should absolutely celebrate the successes we've had in, in improving material well-being over the past several decades, we should remember that not everyone feels better off today. And that's not always just because of material well-being. These other dimensions of well-being, like meaning from work, family, and community, are just as important. The war for human dignity is far from over. Thank you very much. All right, Kevin. Now Robert's going to come over here. Yep. So thank you very much, Kevin, for being here and giving that lovely speech and writing the report and all your service to the country. Uh, these jobs are hard and difficult. And I want to let you know when you walked in the building today, the energy level at AEI immediately popped up as it did when you were walking the halls before you My, left. Mike Strain said he knew I wasn't anonymous in the New York Times because there was no chart in the piece. Yeah, OK. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Going right to controversial subjects, Kevin. That's very good. Uh, so I wanted to ask you uh, one question about how you think you're doing. A lot of the charts on the non-work population on those uh, three programs, a little not, you know, you're not yesterday. And I know how you monitor economic activity very closely on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you think the administration, the federal oversight of these agencies and the states are moving on this issue to increase work? Do you think work is growing? as the economy is so strong, or, or, or do you still right. have work to do? Well, well, we certainly have a lot of work to do. And, and the thing that I'd like to say, uh, and, and I think everybody in, in this room, uh, there's so much expertise gathered here, can help with this, is that we do have a historically good job market. And the unemployment rate is as low as it is because we started you know, a recovery that started a long time ago. Uh, but it's continued uh, at a much faster rate than people expected. Uh, job creation this year is about double what the CBO thought a year ago, January. And so I think that the economy is doing well, and that for people who care about income distribution and poverty issues, as everybody in this room does, that presents us really with a historic opportunity that we can't squander. Uh, and so, for example, if someone leaving prison right now has a better program to help them reconnect to the labor force, then they're way more likely to get a job now than they would have been six, seven, eight years ago. Right? There are more job openings than there are unemployed workers in America. And so it's really urgent to us in the White House that we get you know, on top of these things, on top of you know, helping prisoners, uh, thinking about work requirements. Because if you put a work requirement in precisely at a time when there are all these job openings, then the work requirement can really reconnect people to society right now. Uh, if you do something like this in a recession, of course, then you're just taking benefits away from people in a, in a pretty unfair way. And when you talk about work requirement, it sounds to me like, as a, a representative of the federal government, you're talking not only about a requirement on the individual, but also on the program that has not paid sufficient attention to the issue of employment. Is, is that right? I mean, do you want a little more affirmative government from the SNAP program and Medicaid to do more than just this sort of their, their previous mission was just provide health insurance and just provide food assistance? Yeah, I think we need to reconsider all the programs and recognize, as you saw in our chart, that it's the programs without work requirements that have grown the most. So we talked about the success and, uh, and winning the war on poverty. And I have to say that it struck me as being a little bit inconsistent with some of the rhetoric in the president's inaugural, where he talked about a carnage in America and America's inner city. Um, how, how, does, how, do you, how do you put those two together? That's, you know, that's actually uh, like one of those uh, tricky questions for me because I arrived in June and I didn't write the inaugural speech. And, and I remember watching it, but, but, but I wasn't 
I wasn't involved in the creation of it, and I've not studied it carefully. So, so, so I don't know. It, it's hard for me to go back and look at what the inaugural speech, and, and that, like if it was a speech from last week, then it would, of course, CEA, all these people over here, you know, poor Nicole, just like you're pulling all nighters checking the facts. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think the, the bottom line is this is a super high priority for the president, uh, and that everybody on the team recognizes the urgency of trying to fix things now because the job market is at a historic high. So we're trying very hard to get struggling Americans who are receiving various forms of public assistance and not working into the labor force and working and earning so that they can move up and earn their own success and have the dignity of a job. Um, outside of the safety net programs, what is your view about the role of immigration policy or uh, trade policy in that effort as well? Is, that, are those, are theirs, is there opportunity to help struggling Americans get into the workforce through those, venue, those policy areas? Right, well, I mean, if you have skills-based immigration, then um, you know, highly skilled uh, people tend to uh, increase productivity uh, for people in the firm that they work at and help increase their wages and the demand for workers. And there is some literature, literature on that. And with regard to trade policy, you know, the, the uh, OECD put out a report uh, this year, their, their analysis of the U.S. economy, where they provided a simulation of the global economy if uh, President Trump is able to achieve his objective of getting everybody to lower their tariffs to our level and their non-tariff barriers to our level or even to zero, we'd, we'd take that too. And that's a massive positive for the economy. I think that one could get carried away uh, saying that that's going to create jobs if you consider that you know, that there are organizations around town that think that the natural rate of unemployment is well above where we are right now. Uh, and so I think that there's a role for trade policy, certainly especially in providing an insurance policy against future uh, declines. Uh, last question for me, and then I'll open up to the audience. Um, uh, who was the, what, what do you think is the biggest ingredient that led to the, the, the reduction in material well-being? Of, of looking back over the you know, 40 years or 45 years, if you, know, if you were going to say we won, who was most responsible? Oh, um, you know, I, I think that well, certainly it, who's most responsible part of it would be people like you uh, oh, no, and, no, and no, Bell no. Uh, and, and who Haskins. helped people. Ron, yeah, you know, there, yeah. Uh, people who helped describe these programs to people and uh, evaluate how they work and let them think about how to make them better. And uh, you well, know, they're, they're, so, so I, but I think that, that if you look at the um, share of benefits in my slide, that it kind of answers your question. Right, well, in terms of like, if, if you give people money, it turns out they then have money, uh, and, and 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 so and so if you're asking like, well, which programs gave them the money? Then I had a slide on that. Yeah. So, in other words, it, it, the EITC, which was not a great society initiative, it was more a later initiative. Certainly very or, important. Or yeah. welfare reform, again, not begun in the '60s, done in, in the '90s. They also contributed. The, sure. the war on poverty wasn't won by One the thing. great society alone. Correct. Okay. Questions from the audience. Got some distinguished people here. Well, the first hand up is right there, Galen. Hi, I'm Galen Carey of the National Association of Evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, you mentioned the, the idea that we have cyclical uh, changes, and so right now is a really good time to work on work requirements. How could you do that in a way that doesn't, down the road when there is a recession, uh, have the unfair uh, impacts that you talk about for the unemployed then? Uh, is there a way for the work requirements to be made flexible that way? You know, you know the, uh, the fact is that if we reconnect people now, it's something that, going back to my work at AEI on long-term unemployment, that there, there tends to be this problem that people who are disconnected are really, really hard to reconnect. Uh, but then once they're reconnected, then they tend to, to stay reconnected. But, but uh, if you look at the statistics of people like over the age of 55 who've been unemployed for more than a year, it's really hard to get them back in. And, and so I think that we're at a historic place where the people who kind of like Major Tom are floating into outer space, that they're disconnected from society. They can be re reconnected. And if they do, then that'll make the labor force much stronger going forward and provide an insurance uh, against uh, recession because we'll have the increase in labor input we need. Like, so at some point, right, if, if you do the math, you kind of run out of uh, of the chain, Delta L economists call it, you run out of workers uh, and it's hard to get growth. And so luring people back in is, is something that you could think of as an insurance policy against a recession. Now in a recession, at, at that point, um, one, one needs to be very 
uh, careful to scrutinize things like waiver processes and so on to make sure that uh, people who are legitimately looking for a job, like a, a, in the Great Recession, um, that, that they get the waivers they need to continue to are, are you worried about a labor shortage? Uh, yeah. 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 I, I mean, it, it's, uh, we've, we've brought a lot of people in. Uh, and uh, you know, I can remember when we wrote down the first forecasts when we got to CEA and looked at uh, Jason Furman's uh, forecasts uh, from the Obama administration, then their potential growth estimates were subtracting almost half a percent a year off of GDP because of declines in uh, labor force participation. And we decided that with some of the policies that we were pursuing, that we could make an economy hot enough that would make the decline slower. Uh, and uh, that, has, that has happened. But, but if we went back to uh, what Jason's you know, completely professional forecast was for labor force participation, then economic growth would have to be probably about half a percent lower than we currently project. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Terry. Wait for the mic, too, please. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm Terry Bergman with the National Association of Workforce Boards. And you've talked about the fact that there are more jobs open than there are people to fill them, looking at bringing people in who, when they're coming out of um, prison, my understanding is there's a great mismatch in the skills between the open jobs and the people who are unemployed. And I was wondering what ideas the administration has for helping people with low skills acquire the skills that they need in order to get jobs. Right. Well, well uh, thank you for that question because we, uh, it's something that, that the CEA has done a lot of work on. Um, the question, is there a skills mismatch? and uh, What do we do about it? And we had our first meeting about it. Was it last Wednesday? I guess I have so many meetings. They kind of, <laughs> excuse me? Last Monday. Last Monday uh, we had our, where uh, the president has appointed a commission uh, to uh, evaluate the government training programs, which are scattered across virtually every agency, uh, very rarely uh, reviewed uh, for, for their efficacy and so on. And um, the Secretary of Labor is pursuing an aggressive uh, approach to uh, increase apprenticeships. I think, uh, if I get the number right, that he reported at that meeting that there are about 400,000 apprenticeships that have been created uh, under that program. And also, uh, one of the things that, as economists, we've noticed about training is that there's, um, there's like a game theoretic, theoretic aspect to it, in that uh, if Robert runs a company and I run a company, and then he spends $50,000 uh, training uh, somebody, then as soon as the training's done, then I can offer that guy a $25,000 wage increase to come over uh, from Robert's shop, and then I save myself 25 grand, right? Uh, and so uh, there's this kind of first mover disadvantage for people uh, in um, training uh, in the private sector. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do is create this positive Nash equilibrium where firms all commit uh, to invest in training at the same time. Uh, because they know that the other people are doing it too, then they'll worry less about the sort of recapture period for the training. What about non-compete or uh, uh, non-compete provisions, or no poaching uh, in sort of particularly lower wage? Uh, uh, That's area. something the firm could presumably require the, the person. Yeah. Okay. All right. the, the, the the history of that thing of that area of the law is that those things are very hard to enforce. Enforce. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last question, and then we're going to let you. Right here. You had your hand up first. I feel I obligated yes. to come back to you. And, and, and Robert's one of my oldest friends here. Today. Yeah. So he's going to hit me with a really tough question. To I, <laughs> I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a <clears throat> consultant. What is being done to encourage the private sector to form projects in their area to accomplish some of these things? Yeah, so, so that's, that's the thing. We should go back, uh, and I, I can send you an email. I'll give you a report on, on some of the projects. But the Labor Department is working on this apprenticeship thing. And um, we've been, from the White House, working directly with firms to get uh, commitments. Uh, you could call them firm commitments uh, uh, to train people. Uh, to train people. And, and uh, you know, there's, we have a long list of firms that, that have made these commitments. But they're, they're basically uh, recruited firm, firm by firm. Right, right at this point. But, but uh, there are millions and millions of uh, training commitments that we've got so far. Chairman Hassett, well, it's thank been an honor to have it's you. Great to thank be you back. for being thank here, guys. and thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Discussion now, which will begin in response to some of Kevin's remarks and the report.
Okay, thank you, Kendra. I really appreciate all that you've done. Make this work. Okay, to respond to and comment and talk about and discuss and debate uh, the issues raised by Chairman Hassett's uh, speech this morning and the previous report that the CEA put out, we've assembled a great group of policy experts who have long experience in this area. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them very briefly, and then we're going to get right into some questions and not make too long individual presentations, but have a real dialogue about the key questions and take it from there, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So starting immediately to my right is Belle Sawhill, the Senior Fellow in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution. She has been a co-director with Ron Haskins at the Center on Children and Families. Prior to joining Brookings, Dr. Sawhill was a Senior Fellow at the Urban Institute. She served in the Clinton Administration as an Associate Director of OMB, where her responsibilities included all of the human resource programs of the federal government, accounting for one-third of the federal budget. Next to Bell is Bruce Meyer, the vis a visiting scholar here at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on poverty, inequality, and the social safety net programs. Concurrently, Bruce is the McCormick Foundation Professor at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. He is also a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and his faculty appointments include being a tenured professor of economics at Northwestern and a visiting professor of economics at Harvard, Princeton, and the University College of London. And then finally, but not least, is Demetra Nightingale, She's an institute fellow at the Urban Institute, where her research focuses on social, economic, and labor policy issues. She was the chief evaluation officer at the United States Department of Labor from 2011 to 2016, where she developed what is recognized as one of the premier evaluation units in the federal government. Before joining the Department of Labor, Nightingale was at the Urban Institute for three decades, conducting research and evaluations on employment, labor, welfare, and other social and economic policies and programs. So thank you all three for being here. I'm very honored to have all of you. I've admired all of your work over many years. Um, so I want to just start with the straight up question. Uh, and I'm going to go Demetra, Bell, Bruce. Um, how do you react to this premise that we fought a war on poverty and, and we won? Well, certainly we still have poverty in the, in the US and the um, the war on poverty programs were really part of a larger agenda of great society that also included opportunity, education, um, post-secondary, and uh, um, as well as kindergarten through 12 compensatory education, all the financial aid that many of us in this room probably benefited from were also part of the, uh, of the uh, initiative that was the great society. So certainly the war on poverty, just looking at uh, trying to reduce poverty by increasing income, we've had a tremendous effect. And you can see that in all the charts, no matter what, uh, mes what message uh, you, you look at. I think that we need to be a, a little careful in assuming that the war on poverty is um, over. And, and uh, we cannot forget about those that are at the bottom end who, have, who we are still struggling with. Um, last year, I was fortunate enough to be on a, a, a group that went to China. And among China's um, five or six top goals for the next two decades is to eliminate poverty 100%, to get down to zero. So one of the issues that we talked about there is that in the US, the war on poverty really did a tremendous job in uh, reducing poverty. And you can see that in the charts that we just saw. The difficult and the challenge is those at the, at the bottom. The last 25% of those um, who are on poverty, it's much harder to address. Belle? Uh, I thought Kevin pretty much said it right when he said uh, maybe we still have poverty, but the original LBJ war on poverty has been very successful. And I think that's right. And I think that uh, Bruce's data on consumption uh, show that. But so do other measures, such as the supplemental uh, poverty measure that has been extrapolated backwards in time. And um, it's been successful because we've done more. 
And uh, not only do we have these safety net programs and the expansion of Medicaid most recently, but the earned income tax credit has been expanded enormously. Uh, food stamps has been liberalized somewhat. And the intention of those programs is to reduce poverty, and they have worked. And so we should all uh, celebrate. And so like um, uh, others, or, or particularly like Kevin and the CEA, I think it's a mistake to always focus, as the press tends to do, on the official poverty measure, because it does not show you what the programs have been doing. And again, I'm sorry, I don't want to steal your thunder here, Bruce, but uh, again, one of the problems is we don't uh, measure income very well in some of our data. There's a lot of underreporting of income from uh, some of the safety well, you, net you, programs. I asked you earlier before we came in, but, but you, you uh, agree that, it, that, it, that the effective programs weren't all uh, great society. There was other programs along the way. I, comment a little bit about Sure. Who. Well, uh, I think the earned income tax credit is by far the most important uh, anti-poverty program we have. And if I have any sort of disappointment in what the CEA did, it was to not give quite enough credit for what that has done. In other words, we can use uh, sticks or carrots uh, to get people into work. And the EITC is basically a carrot. And work requirements and safety net programs, expanding them, is a stick. And I think we can have some combination of sticks and carrots, but I really think there's no question in my mind that the carrots have worked better. Now, the downside is they do cost money. As, he, as Kevin said, this is about a 60-some billion dollar program now. Uh, Bruce? I also, I also uh, yeah, I, go uh, ahead. one more thing. I yeah. also agree that um, we have not done much to increase self-sufficiency. Uh, the efforts that we've made in workforce training and education have been more disappointing. And so I hope we can come back to that. Bruce? Well, let me first say that Jim Sullivan and I, in our work, argued that we are winning the war on poverty, not that we've won it. Um, we've made tremendous progress. And for decades, uh, Republican leaders, President Reagan, Speaker Ryan, argued that we fought a war on poverty, and poverty won. So the CEA and Kevin really need to be commended for recognizing that these programs have been effective. Uh, I think that's a, a very important step. And I should acknowledge that on the left, um, Democrats have uh, not wanted to talk a lot. Many Democrats have not wanted to talk a lot about the progress in reducing poverty for fear that programs would be cut, but that's also, I think, prevented a thoughtful re-examination of those same programs. Um, I think war is an overused and bad analogy here. We have war on crime, war on drugs. I think a better analogy for poverty would be um, treating a disease rather than fighting a war. And if you think about treating heart disease, if the patient's cholesterol comes down, you're not going to say, well, stop the prescription for statins. You may think, well, maybe we should aim for a lower level of cholesterol. Maybe we should try and engage the patient in helping himself uh, more through exercise. You can maybe see where I'm headed with that analogy. Um, and I think that uh, that probably puts us on a better basis for thinking about poverty. Um, to me, the most convincing evidence that, uh, uh, and, and clear and obvious evidence, that we've made a lot of progress over time is that if you look at the housing conditions of those in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, you look at the number of rooms that they live in, the square footage, whether they have air conditioning, a dishwasher, a washer and a dryer in the unit, whether there's peeling paint or a leaky roof or leaky uh, plumbing, 
those things for the bottom 20% now look like or are approaching those for the middle 20% in the 1980s. So it's clear we've made a lot of progress. Now, that also, I think, suggests one of the other big reasons why things have gotten better at the bottom. And it's not just the programs, the safety net programs, which are really, really important, but it's also economic growth. And that's been left out a bit from the discussion, I think, so far. And that's one of the important drivers of improvement at the bottom that we need to recognize. So the report uh, says victory on material well-being, not so great on work, and lots of charts showing non-disabled, non-working recipients of, of programs. Um, how do we feel about work requirements in the programs, either on the programs to make work a part of their mission, or on the recipients? And so, Belle, you're first for this one. So I uh, uh, accept the principle, agree with the principle, that people should be expected to work and should be helped to work. And that is the self-sufficiency objective, which I'm all for. Uh, I think taxpayers uh, expect people to work. They don't want to be paying their taxes for people uh, that could be working and are not. I think individuals themselves want to work. They much prefer you know, a hand up than a hand out. I did focus groups with um, what you might call working class Americans last spring. And over and over, and these are people who are making you know, $12, $15 an hour. Uh, and they were very um, much on the wavelength of we don't like welfare programs, quote unquote. So the principle is fine. Then we get to the practice. And we get into, well, what counts as work? And who should be exempted? And for how long should they be exempted? And um, I think there are no easy answers here. And our answers tend to be conditioned by our values. Uh, there isn't any you know, sort of data that can tell you a whole lot. Uh, in the CEA report, as you saw in the charts that Kevin presented, there was a lot of data on people who are in these programs now who are not working. But what's really important to realize about that data is it is for just one month in 2013. And I think we forget about the fact that there's a huge amount of churn in the low-wage labor market. People might be not working this month, but they might be working next month. And if you kick people off the, uh, these programs um, on a monthly measurement basis, uh, the, you're going to kick off a lot of people because they won't be the same people every month. The people you kick off in January are going to be a different set than the people you kick off in February. And furthermore, most of these people are, uh, as best I can tell from the data I've looked at, uh, they are not malingerers. They have various kinds of problems with the low-wage labor market. The problem isn't just with them, some of it is with them, it's also with the kind of jobs that are available to them, which often don't provide 20 hours of work, or um, they get laid off, and it takes them a while to, you know, so there's right. all, there's all these reasons. Right. And then th this whole thing about non-disabled, well, disability is a really, really squishy concept. Um, and the most important reason that people seem not to be working, even though we label them as non-disabled in the sense that they aren't on a government disability program, is because they're having health problems. We don't have a temporary disability program in this country. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Aparna because she and I have been working on this, and we've become very aware in our group about that uh, problem. So I would, until we have, uh, and, you know, there's just a big problem in this country. Everybody knows about the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. Are you going to cut somebody off med Medicaid because they are um, drug addicted? Uh, I don't think that's going to help them. Now, if you said to me, well, they have to go into a treatment slot, yeah. assuming a Gotta treatment slot is available, right. you know, that, they, that we, we want them to do something and we want to use the programs to nudge them and provide the services that they need, then that, I think, is a, a different uh, story. Um, I also make a distinction between the different programs. 
Uh, I was in the Clinton administration. I worked on welfare reform. I was in favor of what we did. Uh, on um, food stamps, I think it's not unreasonable to expect people without children, without dependents, to work uh, most of the time and to only be on food stamps for three months out of every three years or something like that. Yeah. Uh, when you get to housing assistance, I don't know what to do. I'll, that's, I, I would take, take too long to get into that. On Medicaid, I really just uh, don't think it makes sense. I saw a study that was done on Arkansas, the first state to mm -hmm. get a waiver in Medicaid, and um, it showed that about half of them were already working. Uh, another huge chunk uh, were exempt for all the reasons that mm -hmm. were allowed. And then there was a small group that got kicked off. And a lot of the people who got kicked off would have been exempt if they'd known how to work the system. And they don't even have broadband access. In, in, um, okay. uh, so this was, uh, this was an issue. I'm going to give a little of my former administrator yes, you should. in a minute. But you I'm going to let the two others go and then talk a little bit about how you look at the caseload. So I think um, Bell has said things well. Um, I would argue that uh, with SNAP, um, we've been currently the, the work requirements are fairly flexible. And I think it's, it's very important that when you have work requirements that they um, are sufficiently flexible and that you have sufficient resources so that they can be administered in a, in a reasonable way. Um, but I think we should point out that the current SNAP work requirements are way too generous in their geographic exemptions and exemptions for uh, economic conditions, with the vast majority of the US exempt because of bad economic conditions when we have 3.9% unemployment. That's just uh, not, not I, sensible I agree with that. at all. And um, I think that you do want some exemption or reduction in work requirements when economic conditions are bad, as uh, one of the questioners earlier emphasized. But just the current way that they're uh, written is way, way too lax. Um, I, th I think it's 4.8% right now, right? That it, think, a state right. that has an unemployment rate. And be excused from yes, the right. right. So I think we should also, um, as well as work requirements, we shouldn't skimp on funds to aid in job finding. There's good evidence of some programs that are very effective in helping uh, people get jobs. Um, one example that I recently read about is the Nevada REA RES program that um, Muser and Michelides studied. And this program provided um, a skills screening that led to an individualized job search plan. And that was combined with help uh, putting together resume and other job materials, as well as uh, job referrals. And that program quite sharply increased employment and earnings, So, as well as um, the sticks, there should be you know, some, some aid uh, uh, from our, our welfare agencies in helping people uh, find jobs. Um, let me say one more thing that there's been in, in Kevin's presentation and then in um, a lot of the op-eds and blogs on work requirements, there have been a lot of numbers thrown back and forth about what share of people aren't working, could work, and I think we haven't really put together good numbers to look at that question. And so that's one thing that I'm working on with people at the Census Bureau, um, where you take survey data and you bring in uh, information from tax records and also from all of the uh, important transfer programs. And you can get a much better idea of who, in fact, really um, is non-disabled, not supporting um, another uh, person, ch child, or adult, 
and um, is receiving benefits and not working substantially. And so, so, Bruce, I want to follow up on that a little bit because in your work, you've clearly shown something that we saw as administrators of the program in New York that uh, what people say to people on surveys isn't always the, the whole truth. Either they forget or they don't remember or for whatever reason they don't say that they're a recipient of various forms of assistance, SNAP or EITC or uh, other forms of assistance. And we've shown that clearly and I think that's accepted. But my question is, is that also true with earnings? Uh, and are people yes. working yes. who yes. say, and they not so only, but I want to be clear about this. Yes. They're saying it not only to the surveyor they're not working, but they also are saying it to the agency when they apply and are approved for yes. assistance. I am not working. And then it turns out, well, maybe they really are working. So you're never going to do a perfect job of capturing who's on what programs and who's not working. But it should be clear from what evidence we have that the surveys that Kevin used and others have used, they miss both a lot of people who are receiving benefits but they're also missing a lot of work as well um, that you can see in tax data, for example. So, and you miss even more when you just look at the program records alone. So it's not clear where that's going to come out because there are more people receiving benefits than the surveys indicate, but there are also more people working. Demetra. I mean, I think that the, the issue of work requirements, we've been around, around this for three, four decades, and I know years and years ago, Bell and I had this conversation. I'm one also who believes that work requirements have a role um, in, uh, in benefit programs. I think that the big issue, and I could talk a long time on this, but, I'm, but I won't. I think the big issue is sort of what's the objective? Is the objective to increase employment and help people to achieve self-sufficiency and, um, and raise their income and their economic well-being? Or is it to reduce the welfare roles and the benefit roles? And we've gone back and forth between those, and those are two objectives that um, always come up. And maybe there's a balance of what those two objectives are. You can do both. I mean. you, some people can do both. Yes. Some yes. cannot, yeah, because yeah, sometimes yeah. the priority may be yeah, I got one it. or the other. I didn't other. mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Uh, but I think that if, if the... If the intent is, um, is to enforce the work requirement and reduce the welfare right. roles, the administrative costs are high. And they're highest during bad economic times. Mm -hmm. And um, whatever it is, however, whatever that political balance is, for myself, when I've looked at um, welfare programs for over 40 years, I do believe, and Bell mentioned this, that some people's lives are very complicated. It's complicated to just go from day to day and to set priorities on what they're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. One um, barrier to employment we haven't talked about, which is probably the biggest one, and I can't remember who wrote this op-ed probably 30 years ago, um, was that uh, give, them, give them car stamps. That transportation is one of the biggest um, biggest barriers. And if people are trying to juggle transportation, childcare, their kids who are sick going to school, a sick parent at home, and um, a housing crisis or domestic violence in the home or whatever the combination of problems are, even though they want to work and they tell us over and over again that they want to work, it's not the highest priority in their day of survival. And so for that reason, I say, yes, we should have a work requirement because it bumps up the work priority enough so that you get them in. Once they're in the program, I think then there has to be a much more supportive and, um, and client-driven, individually driven um, plan for them to achieve the success in their lives. So if, um, if I were um, writing the rules, I would, I would be more on the uh, support side and less on the hit them over the, I guess, on the carrot side and less on the stick side, but you need to have both in there. And then the other important point, I think, which we haven't mentioned, is uh, if, if a, a real work requirement or work program is, um, is to be achieved, we also need to have some type of a subsidized employment uh, component as well. And the, 
when the economy is really bad, that's when the, uh, the subsidized jobs come in. So one program that many of you may know about called the New Hope Project in Milwaukee uh, years ago tested sort of having a guaranteed job plus a guaranteed income um, above 150% of poverty as long as you were working. But it recognized that there were disincentives in some of the public welfare benefit programs and also um, uh, inadequacies in the labor market, which at that time were serious. But if people couldn't get a full-time job, they were given a, a public job to fill the gap and to get up to the required jobs. And there was very positive um, results of that, and particularly for children. And the positive effect on children doesn't come from the stick side of work requirements, but it comes from the income uh, generation. So the income effect on child well-being is clear and, um, and uh, convincing across a whole number of studies. And then there was one other point I wanted to make here, ah, that compared to um, 30 years ago when welfare reform was um, increasing work requirements, the, the labor market has changed. And we've already mentioned that a little bit. But when you think about people who are in non-standard uh, employment, that often, and I think probably today, and I'll look forward to Bruce's next uh, analysis, I think that there are more people today who, um, who are not able to, to work full time or even above part time or even on a regular basis because of the nature of the economy, not because of their own activities. And the labor market has changed and the nature of work continues to change with non-standard employment that we need to incorporate that into our um, work activities as well. So from the perspective of a former administrator of the program, um, you know, we know what the agency has accepted as the situation of an applicant for SNAP or Medicaid. The person has said, I'm not disabled, I'm not on SSI, and I'm working age, and I may have a couple kids, or I may be a single individual, and I have no earnings. And so the, the calculation of their benefit is determined based on no earnings. And one thing I think is forgotten here is that Medicaid and SNAP for a household with no earnings isn't really very much and actually doesn't get you above the poverty line. So you need work in order to make it be successful. And I think that we let down families when we ignore the absence of work in their households. And right now, those two programs have been told to ignore the absence of work because their job is to enroll and enroll only. So I, I, I and, and they are large presence in uh, these households' lives. SNAP is a big deal. SNAP is a, you carry the card around, you use it to buy food, you have the security of a Medicaid card, it's a part of your life. And if that significant part of your life is providing you a really limited amount of help, can't eat Medicaid, if you're not sick, you don't use it. And SNAP isn't very much. How, what do you have to buy school books or buy clothing or care for your family? So I, I think the real issue isn't, um, you know, we've done a lot with re relieving material hardship, but it usually is a combination of earnings plus assistance. And when there's truly no earnings, that household's in trouble. And we should be looking to see how we can help them. So the next question, I had to put my little of that in. That's when the moderator broke out of the moderator role and went into the... <laughs> And I'm allowed to do that only once, and I've done it now. No, you're allowed to do it several times. Uh, okay. So the next question is, and this is one that I get when I go out in the country all the time, and they know what the threshold is for poverty. You know, it's under $20,000 for certain households, very low. Um, winning the war on poverty, is that really much of a victory for families that are above the poverty level? Um, what about that group, the, the people that are above the poverty line but really feel like they're struggling and, and in, in, in trouble in America or falling behind. In other words, is the threshold high enough? And is this the only way to measure um, whether we're, we're successful in helping people move up? And so, Bruce, you're first on this, then Demetra, then Bell. Well, quickly, I, I think that one should look at material resources that people have and, and work. Um, but um, I think it's important to realize first that the thresholds have been going up a bit in real terms over time. That's one thing that 
uh, Kevin Hassett emphasized, and that's because... Uh, in the supplemental, you mean? Even in the official, because the CPI overstates inflation. And okay. um, even when uh, the BLS knows that it's made a mistake and it's corrected it, um, it doesn't go back and fix the, the index that it uses to uh, increase the thresholds over time. So they do that with other series, even other price series, and, and with um, income measures. But they don't fix the thresholds, even when they realize that the methods that they've used overstate inflation. And then there are, that's only part of the problem. They're, you know, they, um, they're uh, uh, saddled with trying to produce something on a production basis that is done quickly. And we can, in hindsight, look and see that they missed uh, quality improvements in goods and new goods that weren't included in the index. So that we can tell, looking in hindsight, that the measure quite, quite dramatically has overstated inflation. So that the thresholds have been going up in properly measured real terms. And looking at um, housing conditions is one way to see that um, you know, for, for people that are uh, supposed to be at the same constant income level, their, their housing looks much better over time. Um, but have, having said that, um, I also want to uh, uh, emphasize that when you um, bring in all the income that doesn't appear on surveys, bring it in from uh, program data and tax data, you see a much lower poverty rate, even at official thresholds. So um, when we do that, and this was a big surprise to me, that you get numbers, even at official thresholds, that are not that different from the consumption poverty numbers that, that Kevin was showing. Um, and I should emphasize that those also are incorporating in-kind benefits, but not Medicaid. Um, because we're not quite sure how to, how to account for the value of Medicaid. But we get uh, poverty rates in the, at official thresholds um, on the order of 3 or 4%. So given that kind of number, I think it makes sense to aim for a higher, higher threshold to an when we do research, when I do research with my co-authors, we often look at cutoffs that are multiples of the official poverty threshold. And I think that's what you should do uh, for research. Now, whether you want to use those for eligibility, I think is a very different question. And I'm not sold on using higher thresholds for eligibility for our programs because a lot of income isn't counted, either explicitly or implicitly. So if you're going to raise the thresholds for various uh, assistance programs, I think you need to get more serious about counting people's income. And that's, that's a big uh, uh, job. It's not clear we have the information uh, to do that well now. Demetra, um, uh, you know, I want you to talk a little bit about your Labor Department role. You weren't just concerned about people at the bottom. You were concerned about raising wages and skills for people in the middle, in the lower middle. Right. I, I was going to say, I think that we, we have um, an, an issue of the official poverty rate, which is used for a lot of eligibility determination. But probably what's more important from a societal perspective is to think of it as a relative um, issue, so that the relative well-being of of people is, um, is in, in large part shaped by the reality around them and the well-being of the people in their uh, community, on television, in the nation, or whatever. And as a rich nation, we should have higher standards of well-being for uh, the, the nation as a whole, 
which includes not only tem uh, short-term temporary disability, um, uh, parental uh, and family, family leave, higher um, federal minimum wages, not depending on states like New York that's going to have a really high yeah, um, minimum hurt, wage. Yeah, might which, throw which, people out of work, too, because employers won't hire them. A little bit, yeah. not much, and only temporary. I think over time you would see oh, it. We'll see. Even all the economists say over time yeah. it, it, it evens out. So that we need, as a society, we need to have um, a stronger discussion about how we raise the well-being and economic well-being and shared prosperity for everyone in the nation, which includes looking at some of the business practices as well, which would be sort of um, the role of businesses in providing upskilled up tra up uh, training, which a lot of businesses right now are very interested in apprenticeship and with um, skills training and with other kinds of, um, of supports for their workers because it is hard for them to find uh, workers that they need, but we need a policies in effect that will maintain that even during the down cycles of the economy so that we have fewer and fewer people that are falling um, through, through the cracks at the bottom of the uh, income scale. And, uh, and as the uh, income distribution, uh, as the uh, income disparity is continuing to widen, and I know economists are still looking at this, but it looks like it's getting wider, that, that there, are, um, there are factors that are related there that have to do with uh, not only wages, but with the uh, economic opportunity and educational opportunity for people moving out of high school, perhaps into uh, college or into some kind of a training program. We know from all of the research that's been done, and uh, Bruce talked about the um, REA for unemployment uh, insurance recipients, but they're the people who have some work experience that we also uh, know that whether it is for People with work experience or without work experience, the kind of training that works the best, things that America Works and others, um, others uh, incorporate, is closest to real work and, and employer demand. And so the closer that the training is to a real work, whether it is um, registered apprenticeship, um, on-the-job training, uh, co-op uh, education, um, and, uh, and on-the-job training provided by the businesses themselves, those are going to be jobs that are going to uh, increase opportunity and advancement. So it is not just a wild west out there where people just can go out and find a job maybe, but we need to have some standard approach where we can support people to get jobs that are going to move them into stable employment and upward mobility. So, Belle, you've spent a lot of your career worried about people at the very bottom. Are you now more worried about people in the lower middle than at the bottom? Well, I'm worried about both, um, but it's interesting. Uh, if you look at CBO data, uh, which we just did, uh, and you look at cumulative gains in income uh, since uh, about 1979, I think, uh, what you see is that the lowest quintile incomes have actually, after taxes and transfers, important yeah. caveat, mm -hmm have actually increased faster than the middle class's incomes. Now, the biggest increases have been in the very top quintile, which I think we all know. But I was surprised myself to see that after taxes and transfers, the bottom quintile is doing better than the middle quintiles. So interest, the yeah. answer is yes. And uh, that's not an argument that we should you yeah. know, ignore the poor, obviously. Uh, and I think if we really want to make people self-sufficient, which is what we want and what they want, then we do have to work on a more positive agenda. In other words, the problems are in the labor market. They are not just in safety net programs. Uh, we've got to get the carrots and the sticks working together. And we've got to remember that one of the reasons people aren't working more is because wages are so damn low. And uh, so how do we improve the labor market? First and most importantly, we have to maintain full employment. I was really glad to hear Kevin talk about that. Makes a huge difference. Secondly, we have to make work pay. And that's the earned income tax credit, but it's also minimum wage, and we could debate that. And it's also childcare subsidies. I think we forget that 
Relative to the 1960s, for example, a lot more of the labor force is single parents and two earner families, and they're struggling to, uh, with work-life balance. And without childcare subsidies and paid leave and things of that sort, they're not going to be able to work or work as much. And then finally, we do have to invest in skills. There is a skills mismatch, as we talked about earlier. And I think we need to, uh, and as you know, we've talked about this a lot in our mm -hmm. working class group. Mm -hmm. I think we need to uh, put less emphasis on college for everyone and more emphasis on career and technical education. So that would be my okay. agenda going forward. Hire, growing businesses, hiring more people, yeah, yeah, by the way, the business point, let me add that because it's really important. Critical. I mean, we tend to forget that 85% of all income is earned in the private sector. Yes, right. If the mm -hmm. private sector isn't doing their job, then we have a problem. And as Kevin pointed out, one of the reasons they aren't doing their job is because there's what he called a game theoretic problem here. Uh, if you train your workers and they all come work for me, um, you're screwed. So we have, sorry, uh, so, well. <laughs> so we have to have uh, some incentives, probably through the tax system, for businesses to do the right thing. If, oh. if I could just add one quick yes, point yes. there. Yes, yes, well, the audience, I'm that sure. The, yeah. uh, pri the private sector, the businesses spend our estimates um, from about 10 years ago. We're waiting for the newer survey to come out. Um, seven to ten times as much on job training as the federal, state, or local government combined, not counting the Defense Department. And um, the problem is that they invest in the middle income and higher income employees and not the lower income. So the justification for, for public investment in training is because the private sector uh, doesn't do that. You can, you can increase incentives for them to do it. And I think at one time, I don't know if it still exists in France where they had a training tax, and I think uh, some other countries are, are trying uh, training taxes where there'd be a pool of money for uh, businesses to either use, or if they don't use it, it goes into a, a pool for others uh, to tap into. But we need to do more so that training is in the business, in the private sector, in the employers where the demand for workers is. Couldn't agree more. Okay, let's open it up for questions. It's been a good day. Let's see, yes, sir, right there. I think that's David. Hi, I'm David Menace from AEI. Um, I guess my one question would be, um, how much of the work requirements do you see being proposed right now by a lot of primarily Republican states for food stamps, Medicaid, and other programs uh, living up to kind of the ideal mean you would like to see for work requirements? So is what we're actually seeing on the plate really promising? wants to take that. I have my own. Well, I, I will start uh, if you want. Um, uh, and I would welcome your thoughts on this, Robert, because you have got the experience that the rest of us don't. Sure. And so I really mean that. But I mean, I think one of the things the states are seeing is that it costs a lot of money to do the kind of monitoring uh, that would be required to figure out who is um, uh, making uh, is complicit complying with the requirements and who's not and the state of Tennessee I read is now trying to tap into TANF funds to pay for the extra administrative costs of administering a work requirement under Medicaid and that's uh, up in the air right now at least the last time I read about it so um, it's not even clear that you would save money doing this and I think you would at the same, t and it's not clear that you would increase employment very much. So in Medicaid, I'm talking about Medicaid now. Uh, food stamps, I think, is a little different story. I'm willing to see some demonstrations in food stamps of possibly extending the, um, uh, the rule that now applies to uh, people without children to those who have school-aged children. Um, so the, the experiments in Medicaid are carefully designed you know, they're tended to be, and they're monitored by the federal government. I have some hope that we're going to learn something from that, and, and I think that the idea that, that uh, the Medicaid program, which I think has been so only focused on this one objective and not something else, is a good thing, and I think we should see how those play out uh, um, and monitor and evaluate and, and look at the results. 
Uh, in SNAP, you know, the, it's all in Congress. It's a discussion now at the, in the Farm Bill. Uh, I happen to think that, that forcing the states to do more on work in SNAP would be a good thing for this small portion of their caseload. Um, so at, on the cost, it does cost a little more, but I think there's a lot more. money for it. It's not a lot more. It really isn't a lot more. It's more. But it's not a lot more. It does, it, and there is there are resources in the states. I come from a state, and I have a little bit of a negative reaction uh, toward whiny states that say, "Oh no, <laughs> I can't do it. It's too much." You know, SNAP is 100% paid for by the federal government. Medicaid has a very generous FMAP for most states. So I, you know, these are me. These are households that are in need of attention, and we ought to step up and try to help them, especially at a time when the economy is so strong. I think one of the issues and. Um, Maybe some who are here from CEA can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but on the charts that had the percent of the, pop, of the caseloads that were not working, um, the, one of the um, administrative issues that comes up is that there are many people that are on multiple programs. And so those are probably overestimates. You can't just add them up because some of the people are, are receiving multiple benefits. And when the multiple benefits are uh, considered, one of the first things that, that states are, are doing as they're trying to estimate the number of people that they're going to have to work with is trying to figure out sort of what, what does the, if, if they're receiving um, uh, TANF and, and they're complying with the work requirement, however it is administered, um, does that, is that okay and does that count toward the uh, requirements for the other programs, which it always will. And so it will be SNAP um, and uh, the um, TANF that will come before Medicaid. And so you will get a very, get a, a very small number. And then the issue is, um, is it worth the extra uh, effort for a small portion of the population that might come in? In other words, yes, ma'am. Uh, first, just an observation that uh, Jeff Bezos recently announced an initiative, multi-billion dollars in growing, focused on homelessness and preschool. So I look forward to the day when we can look at a few of these billionaires and ask them, you know, if you're so smart, why don't you figure out this problem? Although that hasn't worked with Bill Gates in public education. Here's the question. Charles Murray famously wrote at one point that to avoid poverty in America required four things, to finish high school, get any job, avoid having children out of wedlock, and avoid- so Bell wrote that. Oh, I'm sorry, did you? That's, that's okay. That's Bell. I, 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 <laughs> fabulous, I guess yeah, he, he repeated it. We call and, it the success sequence. Yes. Okay, yes. And get, Ron Haskins had, uh, some role Some in that role as well. In that too. Yes. Right, and the fourth. And now Brad for Wilcox. Quick, yes. Go ahead. I'm yes. sorry. And the fourth item was avoid substance abuse. So when I heard yeah. that, it certainly suggests there is a communication problem to getting that message into kids at the right age. Uh, and I'm wondering if this sort of angle on personal responsibility is that completely dead in this analysis? I haven't heard it mentioned today. Well, getting a job is about. Yeah, yeah, you, so, you will like ahead. my book, so you've given me an excuse to advertise my new book. Uh, it's called The Forgotten Americans. It's being released this week, uh, and it very much talks about what you just said. And in fact, I argue in the book that we, nef we need to start with values, and it's one reason why I said in our earlier conversation here that, you know, really our values determine uh, what we're going to do in terms of work requirements. What expectations do we have? There's no magic answer. But I do think that right now, this could change, you know, a few decades from now. Uh, we are a wealthy country. It's not like we couldn't afford to not having people work. We could afford a universal basic income. But that's not where I think the values of most Americans are right now. They do believe in education, work, and family, and they expect people to do well in each of those areas. And they say, I'm oversimplifying, if you're not doing well in those areas, that's not my fault. That's, you know, you're getting what you deserve. So this deservedness concept is very, very strong, and personal responsibility is 
highly supported in this country. In fact, I've begun to worry, particularly since I did these focus groups I mentioned earlier, that sort of liberal elites here in Washington, D.C., in the think tank community, um, are really a little bit uh, out of um, tune with an awful lot of ordinary, middle-class Americans. OK, I, I, and I would say on, the, on that, sort of the, the success sequence, the extent to which the success sequence or personal responsibility being a component of the Medicaid message or the SNAP message or the housing message is what I think is part of the problem. Those have not been told to talk about those sorts of issues very much because that's not their job. Their job is to get people to bend. That, I think, isn't helpful to the people but Last one, question one, from one of the yes. issues, though, that's related to that, and you, you touched on it, is sort of the issue of homelessness, for example, is the same thing with the issue of employment or non-employment. It, um, it is, there's a continuum. It's not that people are um, living on the streets, but there's an instability, home, uh, housing instability, just as there is an employment instability. And that, um, as a society, we then need to address sort of the values issues because we have to, as Bell said, we have to make sure that the, we have uh, strong families, um, strong work, and what was the third one? Strong education? Education. Yeah. Education. Well, um, you know, work, we already said we got a little bit of a problem there with not everybody having equal opportunity for work and not all the jobs are good jobs. Um, we also need to address education, which we haven't talked about here. So there's a disparity in education, which affects then the values of uh, children growing up and the opportunities that they have. And we need to do what we can to strengthen uh, families as a society and not all the responsibility of the individuals in the household. So we're going to have one last question, and, thank, uh, and then we'll thank the panel. Go ahead. Uh, Corey Hushak with the Center for Equitable Growth and, the, and a former student of Dr. Myers. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the consumption poverty um, index in this, and I wanted to ask, does that include child care costs, um, health care costs, education costs, which make up a growing portion of a lot of the household's um, consumption? So we usually do things two ways, just looking at what people spend on food, housing, transportation, actually just food at home, not, not food away, um, and look to see how that matches up if you include all consumption. And they give you the same picture. Um, after welfare reform, uh, when more single mothers in particular were, were working more, we looked at uh, what happened to uh, the consumption patterns of the single mothers. And there was, you could see an increase in expenditures on transportation and clothing, but that wasn't the uh, bulk of the increases in, in spending that you saw even at the bottom uh, for uh, single mothers. So um, even accounting for people's spending on, on uh, things that you need to do to work and child care, um, you still see these patterns. Good to end with a very technical question. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to our distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks.